You've noticed that my wife Kathy is not at the piano this morning. She is in Atlanta for a conference, a snowy conference too in Atlanta, Georgia. Who would have thought that for Atlanta? But anyway, when she flew there, pilots use an interesting terminology I've always found fascinating, that they don't refer to the people on the airplane as passengers, they're souls. And it's because not everyone on board is a paying passenger. You can have children that sit in the laps of parents, and they're also on board. The, the flight crew, well, they don't have to pay, all right? So they're not having to pay for the, to do their job. You also have folks in the jump seat or those who are deadheading, who are having to work for the airline perhaps and having to get to a place. And so there are souls on board. There are so many souls on board. I found that interesting because... You know, that's my terminology. That's, that's what God said in Genesis chapter 2. When God breathed into Adam, Adam became a living soul. He became a living being. I want us to talk about souls, who we are, soul as living beings, every soul worth living. We're going to be in Genesis chapter 21, and I'm going to just quickly tell you where I'm going to be. I'm going to try to give everybody unicorns and rainbows today. I want everybody to be happy. And so the way I'm going to do that is here's where we're going to go. If you are a conservative, you will be glad to know that I'm going to be against abortion. All right. And if you're a progressive, you'll be glad to know that I'm against the death penalty. All right. And if you're a conservative, you're going to be glad to know that I'm against euthanasia. And if you're a progressive, then you're going to know that I'm for flourishing life. All right. It also means that if I'm making everybody happy at the same time, I'm making all of you upset about something. In reality, though, I don't think any one of us is all progressive or all conservative. We're a little bit of a mix of the two. And that's where I stand as well. Genesis chapter 21. Our setting is in the story of Abraham and the, story, the son of promise. Abraham was promised, you're going to be the father of a multitude of many nations. How's that going to happen? It's going to happen through, of course, his son. And Isaac is born early in chapter 21. But there's still Ishmael, don't forget. That's Abraham's first son. Let's pick up the story in verse 8 of chapter 21. Let's stand at the reading of God's word this morning. The child, meaning Isaac, the child grew and was weaned. And on the day Isaac was weaned, Abraham held a great feast. But Sarah saw that the son whom Hagar, the Egyptian, had borne to Abraham was mocking. And she said to Abraham, Get rid of that slave woman and her son, for that woman's son will never share in the inheritance with my son, Isaac. The matter distressed Abraham greatly because it concerned his son. But God said to him, do not be so distressed about the boy and your slave woman. Listen to whatever Sarah tells you, because it is through Isaac that your offspring will be reckoned. I will make the son of the slave into a nation also, because he is your offspring." Early the next morning, Abraham took some food and a skin of water and gave them to Hagar. She set them on her shoulders and then set her off with the boy. She went on her way and wandered to the desert of Beersheba. When the water and the skin was gone, she put the boy under one of the bushes. Then she went off and sat down about a bow shot away from, for she thought, I cannot watch the boy die. And she sat there. She began to sob. God heard the boy crying, and the angel of God called to Hagar from heaven and said to her, What is the matter, Hagar? Do not be afraid. God has heard the boy crying, and he, as he lies there, lift the boy up and take him by the hand, for I will make him into a great nation. Then God opened her eyes, and she saw a well of water. So she went and filled the skin with water and gave the boy a drink. God was with the boy as he grew up. He lived in the desert and became an archer. While he was living in the desert at Paran, his mother got a wife for him from Egypt. You may be seated. I've already given you four points of my application. So right now what we're going to do is just simply walk through a couple of points that gives us the setting. And we're going to begin by looking at answering the question, what is God's will? 
It's a question that we have. What is God's will? Unfortunately, too often we append a little phrase at the end of what is God's will. We usually say, what is God's will for my life? And I've been trying to get all of us and myself included to drop that off. We need to focus upon what God's will is. Let's do that. And when we do God's will, we're going to be doing God's will for our lives. That's what God wants us to do. But somehow it seems so difficult to do God's will and to discern what it is. A lot of it has to do with our impatience. The prayer for patience, Lord, give me patience. And right now, you know, we don't even patient whenever we want to get it. God's answer to that is always wait. Yes. Abraham, God promised him a son. But apparently God was too slow for Abraham's reckoning. Have you noticed how we like to help God out? You know, shouldn't it be kind of a two-way street? God help me and I'm going to help you. God had promised Abraham to be the father of a multitude. And Abraham was 75 years old. And at 58, almost 59, I pray to God, Lord, please, please don't let me have that blessing of a child, all right? Now, maybe Kathy will say something else. I doubt it, all right, if she were here. I won't speak for her because she's not here. I think really if God wants it, it'd be a blessing. But at 75, Sarah at 65, this is not usually the age when you want to start a family. And as time goes by, this is usually not the time where your chances of having a child increase. They usually what? They usually decrease dramatically. And so Abraham thought, maybe I'll help God out just a bit. God, I'll let Eliezer, my servant, become my son. He will inherit everything. And it is known in Abraham's time period that, that patriarchs of a great amount of goods and wealth would adopt, if they were fatherless, would adopt a servant to be their son. That's what Abraham was doing. But God said, no, 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 nay, nay, we're not going to do that. It's going to be a different way. And so Sarah thought to herself, you know what? I'm going to help God out. Abraham, go in and lay with my servant, and she will conceive and have a child. You know, that's always going to be a good idea, right? You know, when a wife says, hey, why don't you try this out to get a child with another woman? We know that's not going to work out. And Abraham said, sure. And this is where we have Ishmael. And God said, no, that's not the way we're going to do it. Nay, nay, nay. We're not going to do it that way. It is going to be through your son, Abraham, when you're 100. Abraham waited 25 years for God to fulfill his will. 25 years, that's a long time. But God did it that way, God's will. Do you notice that in our story, Sarah doesn't come across very well? Stereotype, all right? I, I don't want to be a stereotypical type preacher, but okay, they, they, you know, it was like Sarah got on her broom and was flying it around, okay? I mean, she comes across that way. She is so harsh and so bitter. And Abraham, it's, it's his son. How can I do this to my son? Did you read whose side God's on though? He's on Sarah's side. Sarah knew that Ishmael, as the older son, he is going to inherit the majority of Abraham's wealth. He is to be the son. And so Sarah knew he's got to go. We have the word in the NIV, how Ishmael was, was there mocking Isaac. That word can be negative can be making fun of, can be trying to hurt him. It can also just simply be a word for play. He could just have been playing. Scholars love to debate this. And when scholars debate things, it's usually of high insignificance, all right? Because the point here is that Sarah knew this isn't going to work. It can't be this way. These two boys cannot grow up together. Ishmael must go. And so Abraham sends out Hagar, his oldest son with her, Ishmael. God said, this is the way it's going to work. It's interesting how God still works when we're head. Have you ever gotten headstrong with God? I know I have. I have thought, Lord, my turn. I'm going to let you, I'm going to let you off the hook. I'm going to help you out, all right? 
And of course, my way is never the best way. God's is always the best. But even whenever I get headstrong, when Sarah was headstrong, let's do it this way and we have Ishmael. When Abraham's wanting to be strong-headed and God said, no, we are going to send Ishmael away. Even when your heart headstrong, God says, my grace is enough and I'm still going to work with you. God, why didn't you step into this story? He did. He brought salvation to Hagar and Ishmael. God, why didn't you step into the story sooner? Why couldn't you have sent some of your angels, some of your messengers just to sit Sarah down and just tell her what for? Look, I know we got to get rid of them, but you know, don't be so mean. Don't be so bitter. Trying to help God out, aren't we? I don't know how or in what ways God worked in the life of Hagar and Ishmael when they were in the wilderness not knowing what was going to happen. Hagar thinking they were going to die. But folks, you don't go through a situation like that unchanged. And God used that situation to shape and form their lives. We don't like pain. We don't like suffering. But God uses pain and suffering as a crucible to bring changes in our lives. And usually so that our lives can be the better for them. We second guess God so much, and yet we should not. We struggle to accomplish God's will. Abraham did that. He struggled. He didn't want to send Ishmael away, but God knew that that was the way to do it. He had to go. Follow your wife's instructions. Follow your wife's instructions. We think we know better. But in reality, in reality, God knows better. Because there in the wilderness, God met Hagar. Hagar, you see the water. Will you believe? Will you arise? Because God said so. God said, arise. I want you to stand up. Quit being so down. Quit being so focused on yourself. Look at me, I'm a mom, I can't provide for my son. My son's gonna die, I don't even wanna be around him. But yet I wanna be close enough to him, just a bow shot away, she could have still heard him cry. Mom, you're not a failure. Stand up and you won't be a failure. Because I wanna show you where the water is. Now you have to go. Whenever God renews our faith, he wants us to renew our actions also. And that's what happens here. Because Hagar, Ishmael, you seem like disposable people. You seem like discards from our society and our world, but you are not. God says, I find value in who you are. No matter who you are, God has value. You are made in the image of God and you have value. You have importance, you have significance. Some of us have been reading about a little girl named Harmony Montgomery. I think it was last month where finally a missing person report, a missing child report was filed for her. How long has Harmony been missing? She's been missing for two years. Two years. Mom has had her issues. Harmony was taken away from her. Dad doesn't appear to be much better. And somehow she fell through the cracks of the system. Her mom, with her addictions, couldn't get people to listen to her. My daughter is, listen, is missing. We ache in our heart for her, don't we? We pray for the best. We pray for the best. But we also know what might be. Galatians 3, 28, 29, Paul talks about salvation, about Christ. He died for everyone so that there now is no longer Jew or Gentile, male or female, slave or free. All have value. All are important before God. And the way that we apply it here, the way that we see that this works out is I want us to think about child, Ishmael. Let us walk through and apply now the fact that we want children to have a chance at life. Now, I... I enjoyed biology, high school and college. I wasn't pre-med. 
I didn't enjoy biology that much. All right, yeah. I didn't enjoy studying that much either. I admire those who did, did all that biology and all that math and all that coursework. But as I understand life, life begins at conception by every definition of what life is and not at some arbitrary point along the way. And for me, that's why life is important and it is significant. Now, I say this as an individual who can never have an unwanted pregnancy, all right? I understand that too, because I can't get pregnant. I think that's biology too, pretty much. And so, ladies, I look to you to take the forefront, but it doesn't mean as a male, I don't have a word. I still have a word. And I believe that life is important. No life is less important than another. Some individuals will need more help than others. Some groups will need more help than others. But all are important and significant and meaningful, and all are made in the image of God. And so, yes, I want children to have a chance at life. Life is wonderful. I also then, as children, I want them to grow in wisdom. We want that. We want our chil children to be successful, right? I mean, we don't sit there and go, well, what do, you, what do you think about children? What do you have planned for them? I want them to be unsuccessful. I'm going to add a basement onto our home and have them a place to live for the rest of their lives, you know, and, and then I'm just going to buy computer games for them, right? And then they're going to have a satisfying life doing that. I don't think that's what we mean by success, right? I want my child to be unsuccessful. What does success mean? What does success mean? I'll ask you this. This is going to be, I'm not going to ask you to answer out loud. It's a right and wrong question. What is success according to the Bible? Where is knowledge according to the Bible? It starts with the fear of the Lord. That's where it is. And somehow when we start making plans and talking about our children's future, the fear of the Lord drops off the radar. And we start talking about opportunities at different schools and different majors and about different career paths that they can take. And there's nothing wrong with that unless we have divorced it from the fear of the Lord and getting to know God better and better. So folks, yes, I want us to live wise lives. I want our children to live wise lives. But some of us, some of us have paid as, you know Dave Ramsey? I think most of us know who he is. And his stupid tax, right? You know, have you ever done something foolish with your money? And Dave Ramsey calls that a stupid tax, right? And everybody's paid it, okay? I, I mean, my investment strategy has generally been, looking back at my history, is to buy high and sell low, all right? And that doesn't really work out so well, but that's what it is. That's the stupid tax. And I'm going to let Dave Ramsey in on a little secret here. You know, the stupid tax isn't just with money either. It can be with all of life itself. Folks, wisdom. Not everybody makes wise choices. And some folks make some folks make foolish choices and they wind up in prison and some wind up on death row. And some of the folks on death row have done some things. It's hard to feel sorry for them. You feel compassion for their victims' families and their victims. But they're still made in the image of God. I don't know if you're seeing on online or not, but in the worship center, the light keeps coming on and off a little bit. I, I'm not sure if God is saying, good point, not so good. Good point, not so good. All right. <laughs> I'm just going to keep rolling with what I have and let you make a decision about it. All right. Folks, our death penalty today, it's not constant. It changes. 20 years ago, there were things that weren't, death, weren't capital offenses that are now capital offenses. What's changed? Well, the law did. And no one has come up with a error-proof death penalty, knowing that, yes, that's the right person. 
No one's come up with that yet. We want our children to grow in wisdom and use that wisdom. We want our children to have good health. If you watch television lately, and I mean television, not screens. A lot of you are young and you don't know what network television is, okay? Because you never watch network television. That's ABC and NBC and CBS and Fox. That's network television. Then you have cable. Cable's what us old folks watch, all right? You watch YouTube and TikTok and three other things that they've come up with with videos that I don't even know about, all right? But if you watch television, you have had your heartstrings pulled by St. Jude Hospital, haven't you? I mean, their commercials are everywhere right now. And the children are so cute, you want them to have a chance at life. Many of us are on the email for Driscoll Children's Hospital, and we hear some wonderful stories about what Driscoll Hospital is doing. We want our children to have a full life. But what happens when we get to a point in life when the pain is so much and so constant and has lasted so long, can't we say at some point, I want out of this? Don't you think Hagar was there? Ishmael, it's time to check out. And pain doesn't have to be physical pain. It can be psychological pain as well. I've had some days where it's like there's no reason for me to feel so down and sad and bad a depressed day. I can't fathom what that would be having that month after month, year after year. What did God say to Hagar? No. No, this is not the end. You're not going to go out like this. And that's where I step in and say to anybody in pain, life is wonderful. And if we're going through a tough time, don't let this pain speak to you about your potential, whether it's physical pain or psychological pain. Don't let that dictate to you the value of your life. And then we want our children to prosper. We want them to be successful. We want them to know the Lord. We want them to excel. We want them to have opportunities. But most of all, as I've mentioned, we want them to know the fear of the Lord, to walk with him every day, each and every day. In a couple of months, we're going to be running across and realizing that this little kid or that little kid has grown up and they're about to graduate high school, usually about to graduate college. Oh, my goodness. I can't believe you're about to graduate college. So what are you going to do? Don't ask that question. That's the number one question that those who are about to graduate don't want to have to answer, all right? And it's because... There are so many things that they have ahead of them. My, my older son, mathematics PhD, has a great job. He does very little math. Very little math in his job. Lots of computer coding. Lots of computer coding. Lots of trends, looking at, looking and evaluating trends. Not a lot of math. What I want to ask and I hope I can remember to ask this, is how are you going to decide? You've got so many things you can be. How are you going to decide? I'd like to know some of that person's process. Each person will probably do it a little differently. But it can be kind of fearful. And I'm hoping that they're going to say something about the Lord. And if not, maybe I'll add something. That's kind of my job, right? I'm a preacher. I kind of preach about God. And about God's involvement in that process. I want to prosper. And I want life to prosper, folks. It's good. And there are some folks, there are some folks, they're going to need help. And they are always going to need help. Do you know who I'm talking about, right? People who always need help. They just don't seem to get it. Let me give you the definition. They're called human beings because every one of us needs help. Because God does not call us to live a life that you can figure out on your own. I will tell you this. If you've got life figured out on your own, that's not from God. Probably more from you. 
God is going to give you something that is impossible because he wants you to depend upon him. And then he wants you to get help from fellow brothers and sisters in relationship with him to also help you out. So folks, when we find people who are chronically in need of help, they're living life and they need help. And that's the call upon us as followers of Jesus to help them, to help them live this life, just as you and I need help as well. A lot of what I've talked about is very general and not specific. And our beliefs and views are all over the map, even in this room and online as you watch. But I think we can come back together to one as we conclude and come to an end, is that we want every soul to enjoy God's way of life. I want everyone to flourish in the life God has for them. I want everyone to enjoy the presence of Christ in their life, the way that I have Christ in my life, even better. And that's our goal. What is God's will for you, every soul, to enjoy God's way of life? It begins by knowing Christ as Savior. He is the one, as I mentioned in our Lord's Supper time, died on the cross for each of us so that we have an opportunity to share in the victory of the cross because our sins have been covered over. Grace is there if we believe. And then life truly begins to be lived in him and enjoyed in his presence. What is your decision? In a moment, I'm gonna have you stand. I wanna pray with you. And then we're gonna have our praise team back up here and they're going to lead us in a song. And I'll be standing here at the front for those of you who are here in the room that would like to speak with me, pray with me. Online, if you're online, you can scroll down and punch the orange button and click on the orange button and somebody will pop up there. Also on Facebook, Facebook Messenger, you can use that. And in fact, I'm gonna give you a phone number. I'm gonna give you, there's the church's number. I'm gonna give you my cell phone number. Obviously, I can't answer it right now. But I'm gonna give you my cell phone number and you can call me later or leave a voicemail. My cell phone number is 361-944-5524. If you want to pray with me, I wanna give you my phone number to make myself available to you. But in our worship center right now, let's stand. Let's bow. Let's let God speak to us through his spirit. Lord God, this life is wonderful. It's incredible. It is awesome. But it is only lived in you that way to fullness. Lord, such a great salvation that you've given to us. That's what the writer of Hebrews says. It is so great. Bless each of us now, Lord as we open our lives to you to show that life is wonderful and is that we share that wonder of life in you with others. In Jesus' name, amen.